Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. If you leave the market alone, it will work over time and it will work to the enormous net advantage of all of us. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Vertical Space. Today we are delighted and honored to introduce the Honorable James H. Burnley IV. It's not often you have an opportunity to hear from one of our nation's foremost authorities on transportation law and policy. Jim has a vast background and wealth of experience, including as a former United States Secretary of Transportation. Listen to Jim's perspective on the free market, on transportation issues overall, on aviation, and how advanced air mobility fits into the bigger picture of transportation and logistics. I have to tell you, I've loved economics in school. I was and am a disciple of the free market, and I soaked up Jim's comments about the free market and its ability to address so many of our challenges with exciting opportunities for our entrepreneurs. Listen to Jim's answer to the question of how he would evaluate a transportation system. How would you answer that question? I recently spoke to a large transportation and aviation audience and asked them the same question. Jim's response is golden. We speak to many in our industry who are at times critical of our regulators. Listen to Jim's recommendations on working with regulators, a lesson for so many in our industry if they want to advance their technology. And listen to Jim's recommendations to our entrepreneurs. How often do you directly hear recommendations from someone of Jim's background and perspective? Well, you will today. A smart, tough, experienced, knowledgeable, national and global transportation leader who doesn't hesitate to tell like it is. Today, you get a chance to enjoy this conversation with a national treasure, the Honorable Jim Burnley. Enjoy. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let U of Ionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access, or beyond visual line of sight operations. U of Ionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation, and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace. So we are honored to introduce today's guest, the Honorable Jim Burnley. As a partner at Venable, Jim focuses his practice on government relations and regulatory and legislative affairs with a concentration in transportation matters. Jim served as the U.S. Secretary of Transportation from 1987 to 1989 and is one of the nation's foremost authorities on transportation law and policy. He also served as Deputy Secretary of Transportation from 1983 to 1987 and was General Counsel of the Department in 1983. Prior to his years at the U.S. Department of Transportation, Jim served as Associate Deputy Attorney General for the Justice Department and as Director of the VISTA program in the early 1980s. Secretary Burnley, Jim, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Luka Tomjanovich, please meet uh, Secretary Jim Burnley. Nice to meet you, Jim. Good afternoon. Well, Jim, I'm going to ask you the first question we ask all guests. Is there anything that very few in the industry agree with you on it? And that can be transportation, that can be aviation, that can be advanced mobility. Well, I think that on, uh, you know, the broad range of transportation issues, that certainly there are there are things where I, my views may differ from uh, the conventional wisdom. But uh, when you go through industry by industry, those who believe, and I don't think it's most people anymore, but there are still some, and and some of their voices are being heard as we speak uh, because of supply chain disruptions and the like. Those who believe that more economic regulation is the answer to issues like transit, what I believe to be transient supply chain uh, issues, would find a uh, little comfort in my views. I uh, went to the Department of Transportation in the early 1980s initially to be general counsel, then deputy secretary, the number two job, and then ultimately secretary, just at the time that virtually every transportation sector was beginning to take advantage of having been deregulated in the late 70s, actually under 
the Carter administration, the Democratic president with the Democratic Congress. And there was a lot of uh, activity that was very dynamic uh, through all sectors of transportation. As a result of that economic deregulation, businesses uh, were started and businesses, in some instances, pretty quickly failed. Um, there was a lot of consolidation. Uh, but most of all, uh, the market was very vigorous and robust in sorting out this brave new world of, of being able to make marketing decisions, uh, both as to where services would be provided and what they, the charges would be for those services, transportation services, without having to come to a Washington regulator and get, and get prior approval. I think the U.S. economy has benefited enormously over the last 40 years as a result of that wave of economic deregulation in the late 70s and early 80s. And so it disturbs me to hear voices now that think that somehow putting federal regulators back into the decision-making process, particularly on the front end, as to where services will be provided, how the industry that provides those services will ultimately be structured, uh, how pricing will be handled. I think that would be a colossal mistake, but there are people now and again, I, I, I hope that they're still in the minority, but there are certainly people out there that are calling for uh, such actions. Jim, can you give examples of where people may be overreaching at the present time? Well, I, I, I hesitate to say they're overreaching, but they are reopening issues that I don't think should be reopened because if you leave the market alone, it will work over time and it will work to the enormous net advantage of all of us. In any market, there are going to be dislocations. There are going to be disconnects, but we, we do a much better job getting past those problems and solving them when we let the private sector work through them freely. And I think uh, one example that comes to mind is that there are voices now calling for significant additional regulatory authority in, in the uh, international maritime trade. And uh, voices calling for the Federal Maritime Commission in the U.S. in particular to be given additional authority. So that would be one example that just off the top of my head that causes me to be concerned that we, we may revisit decisions that, again, I think have, have shown over four decades to be the right decisions that, in terms of of how markets are allowed to operate in transportation. Jim, are there any examples within the air domain where you see some of these discussions about increasing economic regulations taking place? No, happily for the moment, aviation, certainly domestic aviation, we're not seeing those discussions. But as happened uh, in a positive way in the late 70s and early 80s, once you have a debate of that sort begin in one transportation sector, at least in the, the wave of deregulation, there was clearly a spillover effect among sectors. And so, you know, when, when you first start deregulating uh, freight railroads and then uh, in 78, Congress passed legislation to begin uh, on a gradual basis uh, economic deregulation of passenger airlines in this country. And then the railroads came back for another wave of deregulation in 1980. And there was also a trucking, interstate trucking deregulation bill passed in 1980. And in 1982, the interstate bus industry was deregulated. So those things did not happen in, in a vacuum. So what concerns me is, is I worry when you, when you mention aviation, that if we were to move back down the path in other transportation sectors of giving the federal government a heavy hand in economic decisions, it could ultimately spill into aviation. And certainly there have been voices in Congress from time to time. I don't recall any in the last 90 days that have come to my attention, but there have been voices in recent years that have, have raised uh, the question of whether the federal government should, should play a, a more aggressive role in economic decision-making in aviation. But right now, the, the most of that noise is on the maritime side. But, but again, it bears watching in a, from the aviation perspective because there can be a spillover effect. 
Jim, so staying on the topic of regulation and deregulation, you have been an advocate of privatizing the FAA's air traffic organization. Is it politically feasible? Is there still an opportunity today? And more importantly, in the world of advanced air mobility, do you see that there's an, another window of opportunity to readdress this issue? Well, uh, let me answer that in a couple of uh, sort of parts. In the next few years, uh, looking just look, being brutally realistic, looking at the political landscape in Washington, I'd be pleasantly surprised if we had another opportunity to have a serious debate about the future of the air traffic control organization. And you mentioned that I was an advocate of privatizing, and I want to fine tune that just a bit. I was an advocate of transferring the air traffic organization out of the FAA to a nonprofit corporation modeled on that NAV Canada. Uh, and NAV Canada uh, was set up, gosh, now 15 plus, perhaps nearly 20 years ago, and uh, has been, by all accounts that I'm aware of, a very successful organization. It has been able to innovate in a lot of ways that sometimes the FAA finds challenging just because of government red tape. And we've also seen in, in a number of, of European countries variations on that approach. Of, of at least getting the air traffic organization out of the executive branch of the government. So uh, I'd like to say that, yes, we've got a real shot at that in the next two or three years, but I'd, but I'd have to be naively optimistic, I think, if, to say that. We did come close or closer than we ever have because the idea is not a new idea. It's an idea that's been discussed in various circles in aviation in this country for about two decades at least really going back even, I'd say, to the late 80s. Uh, when I was at DOT, I raised the sort of basic organizational question at that time, uh, knowing that we had no chance of actually getting Congress to do it, but trying to stir the pot, get people to start thinking in new ways. So, so I think, uh, you know, it will depend uh, when all said and done uh, on how the air traffic organization continues to perform as we come out of the pandemic and hopefully we are are back in a period of sustained growth of aviation traffic in this country. Hope that's going to happen. I expect it to happen. And we'll see how the air traffic organization performs. I, to give credit where it is due, I believe, I think the FAA, within the, the constraints of being a federal agency, has made progress in recent years in its internal management reforms. And that should be recognized. But again, when you've got to go through the annual federal appropriations process to get the resources you need to operate. And then every few years, you have to go through what is called reauthorization, where Congress thinks about the basic legal structure of federal aviation programs and, and inevitably makes some changes. You, you cannot be as dynamic as you would be if you were free of that process and you had user fees coming in from those who use the air traffic organization. And like any business, uh, you could make uh, investment decisions based upon what you see the, uh, in the way of market needs. And so I think, you know, the, I think the day, will, if we have a period of sustained economic growth, which we all hope for, and if air traffic really bounces back, the day may come in a few years where the debate is reopened. But but I don't think it's going to happen in the short term. Now, in terms of other vehicles, particularly drones, which I think you're referring to, there is an opportunity there to talk about the management of air traffic control for such vehicles. And I would hope that the FAA, uh, DOT, and Congress would explore doing what we've done with the contract tower program in this country, where we do have somewhere between 250 and 300 air traffic control towers that are operated by private enterprises that have contracts with the FAA to operate them. And so it's conceivable that some variation on that model might be a part of, of the ultimate set of answers about how to, how to set up a comprehensive air traffic control system for, for low altitude and, and usually unmanned vehicles.
I'm going to step back a little bit. I mean, it's not often you have a former Secretary of Transportation where you can have a conversation. Tell me how you, how do you evaluate a transportation system? Obviously, we we want to emphasize aviation and advanced air mobility. But as you sit back and you look at a transportation system, what's going right and what can be improved upon? And as you see the future, what are some of the challenges and or I'll call it opportunities for entrepreneurs that lie ahead? Well, there's a lot in that question. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I may miss some of it and feel free to come back. Um, one of the things that I've learned uh, since I first was sort of dropped in the deep end of the pool in the early 1980s when I went over to DOT to initially be its general counsel about the transportation world uh, on the national level which then plays out in countless ways every day, is that if you are going to have a successful transportation system, whatever sector you're in, it can be aviation, it can be maritime, it can be trucking, wherever, it doesn't matter. First and foremost, you have got to pay attention to safety issues. Because if you don't, then uh, there are going to be problems. Those problems can uh, be sometimes cataclysmic. And all kinds of folks, including people who mean well, uh, again, speaking strictly on the national level, in the federal government, both in the executive branch and in Congress, all kinds of folks who really don't understand the industry will have bright ideas about how to make sure you clean up your safety record. So I think it's critically important for uh, operators as well as regulators Uh, in transportation to think about safety first, last, and and in the middle. And one of the striking things uh, about the the debate in the late 70s and early 80s about economic deregulation of transportation was that opponents of that deregulation often argued that the almighty dollar would drive all decision-making in the private sector and safety would get lost as a goal, and uh, there would be catastrophes on top of catastrophes as a result. Well, just the opposite happened. And uh, the safety record of all modes of transportation in this country has improved very substantially over the last 40 years. And first and foremost, that's true in aviation. Uh, Now, there's a, a subset to my point on this, and that is that beginning roughly 20 years ago, the then leadership of the FAA and DOT, and to a more limited extent, Congress, but they came to understand this to an extent. There's still people in Congress who don't understand it. But certainly the leadership at at DOT and FAA then and ever since came to understand that we would get better safety outcomes over time to the extent that we made it easier for people who are transportation operators to share information about safety issues with the regulators and with each other. So what happened was we went gradually, but we, we're, we've been there for quite some time now in aviation. We went from on the safety side, kind of the traditional regulator dictates how uh, safety issues are to be addressed. Um, when there are safety problems, it's a contentious process between the regulator and the, the private enterprise involved in the safety problem. We went from that to a, a sort of not really no fault, but but no penalty mindset, particularly at the FAA, to, to encourage everybody concerned when something goes wrong to share information. That evolved into sharing information before things go wrong. So if you look at the record of aviation in this country on the safety side over the last 20 to 25 years, it's remarkable, particularly as to commercial aviation. And it, this change in cultural attitudes is not the only reason that's true, but I believe it's a huge reason it's true. And other modes of transportation have, have not come as far in reaching that kind of, a, of an understanding of the critical importance of the free flow of information. But if you get a safety culture inculcated into a particular transportation sector, as has been done in commercial aviation, then that then, in a sense, frees you up, if you're a private operator, to be able to make other decisions, perhaps to do more experimentation, knowing that uh, that one, 
there's an understanding that you're part of this overall subculture of people who put safety first. And two, if something does go wrong, they're not going to, the first thing that you're not going to have happen is somebody try to put you in jail. And it was very striking to me uh, to see just the other day where a senior engineer at Boeing was indicted for having supposedly lied to an FAA official uh, about an aspect of the uh, 737 MAX problems. And that was taken to a jury in federal court. And the jury in two hours after a a multi-day trial found him not guilty. And uh, I think that was a a very important signal, even from a jury, not people who are aviation safety experts. They understood somehow that, you know, that was not the right way to get the safety outcomes that we all want. Took that as a real reaffirmation, actually, from, you know, outside the aviation community of the, of the fundamental importance of this. Jim, how do you see this safety culture being adopted in the drone space? You know, it's been a challenge um, because you've had a lot of people who for a few hundred bucks can buy a drone and some of them can reach pretty remarkable altitudes. And and the FAA, is, as we know, has sometimes had to play catch up in getting rules out, particularly to restrict such activities around airports and the like, and then enforce them, which is an even greater challenge. But I do think that we've made some real progress in thinking about how to permanently manage that air traffic in a safe way. As most anybody listening to this probably knows who's involved in the uh, UAS world, the FAA's had an advisory committee for several years. I'm I'm chairman of the board of the Eno Center for Transportation, a nonprofit think tank here in Washington. And we've had an aviation working group for a number of years, which I also co-chair. And we put out a report last year making further recommendations to DOT and Congress and the FAA about how to, how to go forward in creating uh, an air traffic control system, in effect, for safe operations. So following up on on this thought, what level of safety in this continuum between general aviation and commercial aviation do you think the FAA will require for commercial drones? And how does that translate to broader adoption, market adoption of drones? Well, I think think what uh, two things. I think what it should do is also the same as what will most likely happen. And that is we're going to have above a very low minimum altitude uh, requirement for positive air traffic control, which will will require that the vehicles have transponders and otherwise communicate with an air traffic control system so that their operations do not create problems with with other uh, aviation craft of various kinds. And it'll be, it'll have to be altitude driven, both as to, you know, the minimum above which you have to have that kind of interaction with an air traffic control system. And then I'm sure there will always be uh, ceilings on how how high you can go with, with such vehicles. So the, the, I think, you know, the technology is probably the least of the problem. It's, it's just coming to a set of understandings that can then be reduced ultimately to regulations and implemented to make that possible. And the FAA, again, I think its leadership, you know, very much wants to move in that direction, direction as rapidly as it can. And, and I think mo- most of the serious players in the industry, particularly the ma- on the manufacturing side, want to move in that direction as quickly as possible. Because that's how, again, once you address those safety issues, that's how you grow the market. How far do you think we are from having this regulation in place? Uh, gosh, um, I wish I knew. I can, all I can say is the progress so far, I think everybody involved would agree, has been uh, agonizingly slow. But I do think we're, we may be getting to a pivot point in the near term, the next year or so, that where it will be possible to then perhaps accelerate the process of getting us to the, to the desired outcome. Whether that's going to take you know, two years or five years, I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. But I think you know, the, the advantages of, of a UAS system uh, an air traffic control system that, that then permits UASs to operate relatively freely. Um, I mean, they're well understood by by people in the regulatory world. I think the people in Congress who who uh, sit on the relevant committees have a pretty good understanding conceptually that that that's a good thing if we if we get to that outcome. 
in the foreseeable future. So I think, you know, everybody involved got good intentions. It's, you know, the devil's always going to be in the details on something like this. And we've still got a, a fair number of details that have got to be worked through. Jim, how do you see the future of transportation? And given that this is a podcast for the entrepreneur uh, as well as others, uh, what where do you see some opportunities for uh, businesses to help solve problems in transportation? Well, I think that the, the opportunities are, are probably boundless. And I'm making many assumptions underlying that broad statement. But with uh, what has gone on uh, just uh, even in the last five to 10 years in artificial intelligence, in the evolution of various devices and systems that are variations on radar and other comparable systems, that, you know, we, we, we've had a rate of astonishing progress and change. Now, has it been in fits and starts? You bet. Um, and if you look on the surface transportation side, it's still in fits and starts. Um, we have people in the private sector who are pushing the envelope in every way they can to bring to market ever more autonomous uh, vehicles, both as to automobiles and commercial trucks. And similarly, in, in aviation and the UAS space that we've been talking about, you see those kinds of, of uh, continuing innovations and evolutions of technology. The bottom line is that if you're an entrepreneur looking for your niche um, in this world, first and foremost, you've got to understand where we are. You've got to understand that things are changing very rapidly. You've got to either be technically proficient yourself or quickly bring into your organization people who are with respect to things like AI. Um, with respect to various systems, uh, sensing systems and detection systems. And those who prosper ultimately will be those who, I think, who figure that out in ways that are not only feasible economically, where whoever your target market is, they can afford to buy your stuff. But beyond that, uh, again, to come back to the safety issue, it'll, it'll, it'll first and foremost be people who are successful in convincing uh, on the federal level, both members of U.S. Congress, the U.S. Congress and people, the regulators at the Department of Transportation, that the technology has matured to the point that it can be introduced into the marketplace safely. And so when it comes to surface transportation vehicles, we all no, anecdotally, we see in the press reports about experimentation on certain roadways um, in certain metropolitan areas or, or in certain states. And that's going to, I think, continue and, and continue to expand rapidly. But in the UAS world, you know, it's tougher because, again, the, you, we've not gotten quite to the point where even on an experimental basis, it, it works to anyone's real satisfaction. I mean, the FAA is... is people in that space will, will quickly agree, I'm sure, is, is trying to move away from having to approve operations beyond the line of sight uh, with drones on a case-by-case -case basis. And the FAA said they, they won't wish to get away from that. But, you know, the, again, the, it ultimately will fall to the operators themselves to build a safety subculture that then permits an entrepreneur coming into that space to innovate and to be able to test the market in various ways before the capital runs out. And so there's a, there's a real challenge, set of challenges there. But if you just have a bright idea and you go, go get a couple of technical folks that, that understand the, the technology you need to start bringing your bright idea to fruition, and you're not thinking about the safety aspects of what ultimately your technology or your desired technology is going to do, and you're not paying attention, at least as it applies to your subset of issues, to how the regulatory world of government is thinking about those issues, then you're not going to be, you're not likely to be successful. I mean, you've got to start out understanding that there, you're not going to get to make a lot of unilateral decisions about will, what will and won't sell. That's a good point. And you so, mentioned artificial intelligence. What early applications of AI do you think that we'll see in aviation first? Well, I'm no expert on AI, um, but but certainly I know from the work we've done at Eno that 
you know, when we get to the point where there's confidence that in a relatively low altitude air traffic control system, that UASs can communicate with that system and where the human operator does not have to make a decision when this, when the system tells it what it can or cannot do, but the, the device itself will make that decision and make it correctly. That, that when we have that in place, that will be the beginning of, of a mature UAS system in this country. And, you know, but again, you've got to build confidence. That's, that's, and that first and foremost, that goes to the operators. I mean, anybody who's been paying attention to UAS over the last decade knows that we've had, we've had some people that were oblivious to those kinds of concerns. And it's the old, you know, one bad apple cliche. So that's why I keep coming back to the critical importance of, of both a, a safety subculture, but also the individuals involved in innovation. Just they, they cannot lose sight of that. Certainly. What's your perspective on advanced air mobility certification, both for drones and, and EV tolls? What advice would you give to companies and to the government? When it comes to individuals, uh, prepare to be frustrated. It, it's all going to be through trial and error in terms of the regulatory system, as has been true with UAS. And it's going to be painfully slow. And so, again, you've got to think about not just the safety side, but you've also got to think about the NIMBY issue, the not in my backyard issue. And if you have ultimately vehicles that are quiet to the point of even being silent, you're probably going to get a lot further than if you're telling people that they're just going to have to put up with a lot of noise in the immediate neighborhood of your operations. That never plays well. So I think all those kinds of issues are still out there to be sorted out. And uh, again, as, look at what's where we are on UAS, look at how long it's taken us to get to this point, and we're nowhere near being one of a mature system as we've been talking about. So, so you're going to have to be, you know, prepared to be frustrated, and you're going to you're going to have to be very patient. Jim, the question of advanced air mobility, and let's let's if we move beyond drones and we think about the electric aircraft and the vertical takeoff, whether it be hybrid, electric, and the like, what? problems in transportation are they solving over the next 15 years? What, what, what role do you think they'll have? If I was that smart, I wouldn't be talking on this podcast. I'd be out <laughs> trying to sell it. But but you asked me. So um, uh, what I will say is that I think that, you know, we all value individual mobility, whether it be for ourselves or our goods. I mean, one of the astonishing uh, logistical evolutions that's happened almost at warp speed in this country in the last 20 years is home delivery. Uh, I'm in my early 70s. When I, when I was a little boy, the milkman came to our house and left the milk on the front porch. Uh, the drugstore delivered the prescriptions. Well, I still haven't got a milkman or milkwoman in my neighborhood, but I can get almost anything else delivered to my front door, including my drugs again, my prescription drugs. So, you know, we, we are seeing um, opportunities on a, on a sort of individual basis, customer by customer. And when it comes to advanced air mobility, I, I mean, it's like uh, you, can, you can sell tickets on a vehicle that will carry as many people as you want to build a vehicle to carry. I mean, we, you know, we think about wide body jets or you can sell seats one at a time in a vehicle that has one seat or two seats or, or six seats. So there's no, there's no sort of clear answer, but to the extent that you can individualize your services in the marketplace, as we've seen on the logistics side in this country in recent years, um, you're probably going to be more likely to prosper. And, and obviously cost is always a consideration. Again, that's the, that's the, the wonder of free markets is that, we give people the opportunity and the flexibility to go figure these things out transaction by transaction, ultimately. Uh, so the answer, the bottom line is, I don't know. And I don't think anybody else knows either, but I'm, but I'm comforted by the thought that there are people out there as we are doing this podcast who are thinking in very specific ways about very specific market opportunities that they perceive and how to, how to fill those. And you like that the free market is going to help answer that question. 
with as little interference from the government as possible. However, anybody who comes online with these systems has to respect, you know, safety first, safety last, safety in the middle. If you don't do that, uh, you will ultimately be less successful. And but to put it differently, if you think about commercial aviation, if an airline has a catastrophe and becomes tainted as a result in the marketplace, that airline tends not to do well and it tends to disappear. Now, again, we, we uh, incredibly have gotten to the point in this country where commercial aviation fatalities are, are quite rare. But if you think back 25, 30, 40 years ago, there were, there were carriers then that, that did not, maybe unfairly, but did not have a good reputation uh, after a particular catastrophe uh, as to safety, and, and people booked away. And ultimately, they tended, some of them just went out of business, but they tended to disappear uh, by mergers. They were acquired. So it's, uh, safety is just, you know, absolutely critical when it comes to transportation services. And, and it doesn't have to just be passenger services, by the way. I mean, again, to come back to the world of logistics. If you are going to build uh, a UAS system to deliver merchandise and you develop a reputation for having some of your vehicles drop on people's heads, that's not going to work well for you either in the marketplace. And the regulators are not going to be predisposed to treat you kindly. Jim, what do you think about Europe's approach and, and Europe's initiative in UAS regulations? Uh, do you think that they have a greater risk appetite? I, you know, I don't know whether it's a greater risk appetite or not. I'm not tracking it day by day. I know that they, in some areas, have seemed to loosen up uh, the regulatory constraints a little more quickly than we have. But I think those differences are more marginal. And at the end of the day, uh, I think, you know, both we and Europe are probably going to come out in pretty much the same place. Got it. What do you think the role of UAS or broadly AAM is in solving the supply chain issues that we're facing and that we will likely to continue to face in the future? There are a myriad of roles. Uh, you know, again, um, will delivery vans who bring things to our doorsteps in residential neighborhoods today be universally replaced in the next 20 years by uh, UAS delivery vehicles? I don't believe that's going to happen. But will UAS vehicles make it possible to develop consumer markets in terms of logistics that where the, the customers are, are dispersed over wider or, or less accessible areas? Well, that, that is going to happen, I think, and is happening to an extent now. So, you know, I think you'll see that kind of market differentiation. And again, the folks who are smart enough to figure that out as to where the where the niches are that create opportunities in the marketplace versus trying to take on established operators head on. But I think the, the former will do better than the latter, although, you know, we, we certainly have people who know how to disrupt what appear to be mature markets and be very, very successful in that. I mean, let's not forget that Jeff Bezos started Amazon out of his garage selling books. He wasn't selling anything but books. And I would have thought that, you know, Barnes and Nobles and its other competitors were very well established. And there were still a lot of individual bookstores around this country. And he took what was a mature market, it looked like to, to somebody like me, and he totally disrupted. And then he proceeded to disrupt other retail markets. So in a way that, you know, as a consumer, I think has been very advantageous to the consumers. That's why Amazon's been so phenomenally successful from my untutored perspective. And I think that's what you're going to see is people are going to find opportunities where they can provide services not otherwise available using UASs. And then there, there are others who will say, you know, I can take a UAS and, and attack a, what looks like a, a mature market place mm -hmm. and make a lot of money doing that. Jim, we had a we had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, Pasha Slay from Alaska Airlines, and he mentioned that we need to find a way. You know, there's five thousand airports out there that are, you know, most of which are underutilized. Yeah. What's your What's your take on that? What's is that an opportunity, and why, and who could take advantage of it? The answer is there are clearly opportunities out there, and there are clearly going to be folks who, once the regulatory system decides that 
such operations can go forward safely in large numbers. Uh, we'll be able to take unmanned vehicles and send them to, again, the more remote areas of, of the airports that are underutilized, quote unquote, tend to be in places where there aren't all that many people. That's why they're underutilized. And so I think that that does create all kinds of opportunities over time. But again, you've got to, you know, you have to ultimately have customers. So I think that that that's just a, a part of looking someone like that looking at a marketplace that, that now doesn't look very attractive in a lot of ways because it, it doesn't look like there are enough customers there. But if you can figure out how to how to build and operate a, a vehicle at a cost that uh, still lets you make a, uh, at least a small profit, you can start providing services there. So I, I think that, yeah, he's right fundamentally. But again, that will be tested by lots of different operators over time, and and some of, and that and, and that still goes on today, by the way, in commercial aviation, passenger aviation, in a big way. One of the wonderful things about airline deregulation is that the airlines have, on countless occasions over the last forty years, tested markets that did not previously exist, city pairs, where they did not have nonstop service, and hub and spoke developed to provide mostly one-stop service to markets who could not sustain non-stop service. And all that experimentation is going on as we speak. Uh, airlines daily make announcements about new service, service being uh, ended or cut back in certain city pairs. And that constant adjustment that we permit to go on because you don't have to go to see the Civil Aeronautics Board in Washington, D.C., like you had to do before we deregulated to get permission to serve from Washington to Greensboro. I mean, that that's created this enormously useful commercial passenger aviation system in this country, useful to all of us. And the mobility that we have today is just astonishing compared to what it was before deregulation. So that's what's going to happen, I hope, with, with UASs in a, in a sort of a parallel universe. Uh, Jim, I want to ask you. So, I, I, let's say you have ten thousand dollars, and you you want to invest it in the future in technologies that will play a role in the future of transportation. Where would you invest, and in, and for what reason? Well, given the rate of inflation, I don't think I'd be able to invest in anything worth pursuing. But um, that's another conversation. <laughs> um, I think that's a you know that's a tough question because I'm not by instinct, an entrepreneur, unfortunately. And I guess that's why I ended up being a lawyer. Um, but but I think that the, the the test ultimately of any investment is whether it you think there is a business case to be made that is a little different from any other business case that's already in, being made in the marketplace. And you can fill a niche, you can find an unmet need often create a demand for a service when you provide a new service. So I'd look for something that, you know, if I were going to be investing in, a, in somebody, a UAS operator, I mean, I'd, I'd want to understand that the leadership of that company had a business plan that was focused on just those kinds of, of niche opportunities. Either I'm going to be more efficient than the people already out there, or there's nobody doing it and I'm going to go do it. And again, I use the you know Bezos in his garage. There was nobody else selling books by mail in, in any quantities in this country in the 1990s. And he just saw a niche, apparently. Um, so I'd look for that guy, but I'd look for, for somebody who's who's got that kind of mindset, and and then you know try to understand what the business plan is, and and then I'd have to ultimately make a judgment about whether I wanted to gamble my ten thousand dollars on that investment jim 10 years from now in our in the, let's say the united states or let's say anywhere in the world what's going to most surprise our listeners what's the biggest change that's going to occur that most people aren't thinking about today for the optimists who hear this i'm I, i'm afraid my answer is a downer in the sense that they they will be frustrated beyond what the level of frustration they expected, sometimes far beyond, at how slowly, particularly in the UAS world and the advanced mobility world, how slowly the regulators move. So if I want to do something 10 years from now that's really novel and unique and I want to be really successful at it, 
you know, I've got to build upon existing systems and structures and then, mm -hmm. and then uh, the experimentation, you know, the, the pushing the envelope has to be at the margin. And, and I would say this as well, regulators do respond to facts. They do respond to sound arguments. They don't always, but they often do. And you first got to understand the regulatory construct as it exists, as it's relevant to what you want to do. And then you need to participate in trying to influence how the regulators see things. And that's actually pretty easy to do in this country. Um, so there are, there are lots of ways to do that. But I worked with a client over a couple of years, very recently, just a few years ago. Um, and we there was a regulation that had been issued 100 years ago by the Woodrow Wilson administration <laughs> that was an impediment to his business aspirations. And I was retained by him to uh, repeal that, get ask the federal government, DOT, to repeal that regulation. And we were successful. We were successful. The regulation, I think, may have been the oldest regulation still being enforced on the books anywhere in the government. There's no way to prove that. It's a huge government. But certainly the oldest by far that I knew of. I mean, it had been issued in 1916. <laughs> and it was still being enforced by the Federal Highway Administration. And we, we convinced them to repeal it. So that freed him up in the marketplace to go do what he wanted to do. So I think it's really important to understand, you know, when, particularly when you're dealing with transportation issues, safety is paramount and you gotta, you gotta understand how the regulator thinks, what, what the regulatory impediments are, whether there is a rational basis for those regulatory impediments. And if they're not, if there's not a rational basis, you can go try to get it changed and sometimes uh, you'll be successful. Where do you see over what time frame and a fully autonomous car, fully autonomous truck, and a fully autonomous aircraft? Well, uh, let me answer you two different ways. I mean, in, in some respects, the technology's arguably already there in some of those categories for, for fully autonomous operations. But uh, I think what you're driving at is, is when do I foresee that the, the regulators the technology will be mature and the regulators will permit it to operate freely. And answering that question is, uh, the, the glib answer is, I don't know. I think we are, will get there first with some forms of autonomous surface vehicles operating relatively freely over broad areas. We'll get there faster on the surface side, I believe, than we will in the air. I, we're just further ahead, I think, both in terms of, of addressing regulatory issues and in terms of the relevant developers of autonomous technology on surface transportation. I think, you know, that the, the most of them are pretty sophisticated. They go find sophisticated people to help them uh, on the regulatory side and working with through what kinds of regulations in a mature world does permit free operations, what those regulations ultimately look like. I think, I think that as a community, they're ahead of the aviation side. Mm -hmm. not, not anybody's fault. I just think that's where we are. But I think, you know, again, coming back to on the aviation side, UAS, you know, we're, we're going to get there. And we're going to get there in, in a relatively few years. But we do not have even a rudimentary air traffic control system for low altitude operations for UASs. And we're going to have to have one. And so we've still got a lot of work to do to get there, I think. And you see the free market as potentially, as you were talking about the contract towers, you see the free market potentially playing a, a more significant role. Oh, yes. Um, I mean, innovation in these matters does not come from federal bureaucracies. And the private sector has to innovate. And then they have to uh, develop mature technologies that are reliable and then they have to sell the regulators on that. And obviously there's some overlap in those sort of three fundamental steps, but that's what has to happen. And, and so, yeah, we've got quite a ways to go yet on the UAS side. And, and again, we're, we're making progress. It's in fits and starts, it's painfully slow. So, you know, I don't want to discourage anybody, but you just have to understand the realities of what you're dealing with. And it's just going to take a while longer. 
So, Jim, I, here's a question you don't have to answer if you don't like. Let's say we told somebody that Jim Burnley is going to be a podcast guest. And what would they say? Let's say somebody who knew you really well. What would they say is going to be the major theme of Jim Burnley's discussion on the podcast? I think the two there are two major themes, and you've heard them both, uh, safety and the belief that the marketplace with a regulated environment as to safety. The marketplace gives us far better answers as a society when it is allowed to function freely on the economics of transactions mm -hmm. versus the safety requirements for those transactions. So I think that combination is what anybody who knows me well would expect to hear me saying. You know, safety, again, has got to be the primary first goal of any significant transportation operations. And uh, once you have accepted that and you live that way and you operate that way, then the federal government and state governments, for that matter, and city governments should, should get out of your way on the, the commercial side and let you figure out what makes sense in the marketplace. And, and I think that combination has served this country enormously well yeah. over the last four decades. You have the current DOT secretary in the next couple in the room and, and the current president in the next couple in the room. And we're talking about transportation. And they said, uh, Mr. Burnley, give us three things that we should keep in mind as it relates to transportation overall. And, you know, this is all forms of transportation. What advice would you give them? I would say safety is your lodestar. And with any new political appointees that come into the U.S. Department of Transportation, I can assure your listeners that if they don't already understand that when they get there, it's beaten into them pretty quickly by the senior career leadership of the department. DOT has been blessed over the decades with some very dedicated, bright civil servants who, thank goodness, stay. But having said that, I would also say to the to the next two or three secretaries, that everything has to be seen through a safety filter first and foremost. But then with all these very good people that you have in place already when you get there, this career leadership I just referred to, they want you as political appointees to provide direction on policy. And they will look to you for that direction. And you not only should feel free to give them that direction, but you should hold them accountable to uh, doing everything they reasonably can to fulfill the policy aspirations that you've set. And if you do that, you're gonna get good outcomes over time. But the third thing is you have to understand that like all subcultures, the, the career leadership and, and then those in the lower ranks at DOT and at the FAA, they can easily become calcified in how they do business and they can become resistant to change. And so you do have to provide leadership, you have to set goals and you have to hold people accountable to those goals. And, you know, it's got to be legal, it's got to be ethical, it's got to be safe and all three are equally important. But if, if what you're asking them to do meets all three of those requirements, then I would encourage you to insist that they follow your policy leadership. And, and you, if you do that, then you're going to be an effective secretary. Let's so. see a, a transportation sec secretary said, what three people should I speak to as it relates to transportation? Who would you recommend that they speak to today? That's an interesting question. There are, particularly as to aviation, uh, but as to other modes of transportation, there are two people who come to mind initially, there are others, but two that I have enormous regard for. One is a man named Robert Poole, who has been thinking uh, deeply and creatively about all aspects of transportation, to surface and aviation, but with a real avi really strong aviation focus for decades. And he was for decades uh, the leader of the Reason Foundation. I think he is either semi or fully retired, but he is still a prolific commentator uh, on transportation issues. And um, he is someone that, that is universally, I think, respected as an intellectual leader in transportation. Yeah, fabulous um, guy. Another is uh, Jeffrey Shane, who 
uh, started at the Department of Transportation in its very early years as a young career lawyer and who cycled through the department several times, uh, ended up in uh, Bush 43 as the Undersecretary of Transportation for Policy, the number three job at DOT, has held numerous other senior positions, including on the international level in aviation. And again, is both a very creative and thoughtful man, but also someone who's sort of seen it all and done it all. So, so those would be two people to whom I would refer anyone who's coming into a leadership role at the Department of Transportation. Uh, Jim, are there any questions that you wish we had asked that we haven't asked that you'd like to talk about? No, you've done a good job. Um, and we've been <laughs> at it an hour, so I think you, you pretty well covered the waterfront. From my <laughs> okay. Lucas, do you have any other questions? No, uh, all good on this end. Thank you very much, sir. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Jim, you got a minute and you wanted it. Somebody said, what was that podcast all about? And what was the one message you would most want to send? Now, I have a feeling I've asked this in a couple of different ways yeah, already. Yeah. But how would you like to summarize it? The best transportation system for this country going forward will be built upon the bedrock that we have created over the last 40 years of a strong safety culture and recognition that we need to let free markets work in providing uh, efficient services at reasonable costs to the American people. Terrific. Jim, you're a national treasure, and it's a real honor to have you on the podcast. We, uh, we thank you for joining us. You're very thank kind. You, I'm going to tell my children that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it. You all have asked thoughtful questions. All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss and goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general, educational, and entertainment purposes only.